welcome back to the wrestling room and welcome back to Seattle and my little office at the back of our property. And if you hear chickens in the background, yes, we have eight chickens right outside my window here and uh, they've been kicking up their heels a little bit. So just try to ignore those. <laughs> and um, you notice I shaved my beard, first beard I've ever had. And um, it was getting scratchy and messy and hot and it was just a mess. So I shaved that monster off. So somewhat uh, clean shaven again. I think I shaved about 10 years off of uh, my life. Anyway, my wife likes it much better and um, get a lot more loving without the beard. So, okay, enough of that. Last week, I taught on the topic of three responses when God has you in a waiting period, when you are in a, in a period where he's pulled back the reins, put the pause, and maybe you don't even know what you're waiting for, but you just sense I'm in a, in a season of waiting. And someone has said that waiting is a form of suffering. And I, I think that's absolutely the truth. There is a pain, there's a groaning that is associated with waiting. And Romans chapter 8 says that all of creation groans waiting to be released from the curse that is on this planet because of sin. And then it goes on to say, we also groan waiting to be released. And so today what I want to talk about is three revelations around the, the issue of time. Waiting happens within the dimension of time within the realm of time. And I want to pull back the curtain and look at what God is doing within the realm of time. What I've found is this. Most people struggle with discouragement, with despair, with doubt, uh, with depression, because they, number one, don't know the Word of God. They don't know God because they don't know the Word of God. They don't know the heart of God, the mind of God, the plan of God, but God has a plan that he's working out throughout history. And when you understand it and you begin to understand the inner workings, though we'll never know all the mysteries of God and what he's doing, but when you begin to get the sense of the inner workings of, of God's plan within time, there's an excitement, there's a boldness, there's a hope that rises up inside of you. And instead of raging against this waiting that we're all involved in, waiting for Jesus to come back, or, or a micro form of waiting in your life right now, you don't rage against it, you work with it, you accept it, and actually anticipate great things coming out of it. So the mission for this particular teaching is to help you gain a boldness and excitement as you understand, we pull back the curtain and see what God is doing within time. And friends, buckle up because what I'm going to share with you is truly mind-blowing. What God is doing. So hang in there with me. I'm going to work through some uh, somewhat complicated timelines with you. But if you understand them, it's going to just explode your understanding of what God is doing. And you're going to be excited. So here we go. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Let's go there together, and I'll read those two verses, and then we're going to pull some truth out of those. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. And so when they, that's the disciples and Jesus, had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, this was a question they'd asked multiple times. And so this wasn't the first time they brought this up, but Jesus had risen from the dead. He was getting ready to ascend, and they brought the question up again. Is it now? <laughs> like kids on the way to Disneyland, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And so Jesus responds. He says, it's not for you to know. The times are the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. It's not for you to know. The times of the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. So we're going to dissect specifically verse 7. So revelation number 1 is that God the Father holds the universal stopwatch. God the Father holds the universal stopwatch. Now, each member of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they all have different roles and functions that they serve. For instance, the Holy Spirit is a teacher. He's a comforter. 
He is a remodeler. Remodeler. He's working on us, maturing us, restoring us to our original perfection, to maturity, to being like Jesus. He's also a reminder. The Bible says that he will remind us of the things that Jesus said. As we, as we read the scripture, as we ingest the scripture, in those moments that we need to be reminded of what Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will pull up from those memory banks the exact thing that we need at the exact moment. He is the reminder, but he's also the empowerer, and that's what we've been talking about in past weeks. Jesus said, you wait in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. You will be baptized with power from the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit empowers us as well. Now, Jesus, what is his role and function? Multiple and many. Number one, he is the creator of the universe. In uh, Hebrews chapter one, God the Father delegates to God the Son the creation of the world. So Jesus is the creator. He's also the captain of the army of heaven. And we see him in Revelation 19 riding with his army, leading his army out of heaven for a major battle against the Antichrist. <laughs> and so Jesus is the captain of heaven's armies. Jesus is also, of course, the Savior and the substitute who came and hung on the cross in your place, in my place, as the Lamb of God who bears in his body and bears away the sin of the world. But finally, Jesus is well, two more things I'll mention. He's the head or leader of the church. The Bible says he's the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. He is the overseer, the lead pastor of the church. And then finally, he's the king who will come in power, in splendor, in might, in glory, and will rule from Jerusalem. We'll talk about that more in just a second. So Jesus has many different functions and roles, but the Father, and we're going to talk about him now, he is what I have found as I've searched scripture, the administrator. He's the CEO. He's the director, if you will. Thus the name or the title Father. So, it says, the Father by his own authority has fixed the times and the epochs. This statement, by his own authority, means that time is the jurisdiction of the Father. Jurisdiction means the area in which he exercises full and complete authority to do as he deems best. So to summarize, the Father in the realm of time, God the Father alone, holds the universal clock, the stopwatch on time. Time is he, his jurisdiction. He alone has the final authority in the area of time. That's, that belongs to God the Father. Now, let me give you some illustrations of what this might look like. David in Psalm 31.15 says this, my times are in your hand. What is he saying? The seasons and the events of my life are under the jurisdiction, under the authority of you, God. Your hand in the scripture, hand is a symbol of authority. And David's saying, my life, the seasons and the events of my life are under your authority. You reign, you rule, you control those things. Job says in Job 14 verses 5 and 6, Man's days are determined. The number of his months is with you, and his limits you have set that he cannot pass, so that he cannot pass. The New Living Translation says it this way, You have decided the length of our lives, and you know how many months we will live, and we are not given a minute longer. God holds the stopwatch. Brothers and sisters, I just want to say this in passing. God is sovereign over our lives. God is leading in our lives. God holds the stopwatch on our lives. The safest place that we can be is in the center of what God has called us to do and be, in the center of his will. We've heard so many times over the last year and a half, be safe, be safe, be safe. Scripture would say to you, God would say to you, be courageous, <laughs> be courageous, be obedient, trust me, follow me. Scripture doesn't say to us, be safe. Scripture says, be courageous and obedient. 
The safest place you can be in the universe is right in the center of what God has called you to do. So hang on to that nugget. As you hear people exhorting you to take, to, 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 to retreat into safety, no, advance courageously, advance with obedience because God has got you. God has got your back. All right, so the Father holds the stopwatch on all of time and on our lives. Now, there are two takeaways that I want to give in this teaching today. Number one, setting dates regarding the second coming of Jesus and the end of the world is not our job or our business. And it is destructive and a foolish waste of time. A foolish waste of time. Jesus said to the disciples, it is not for you to know. But so many people over history have run that red light. They have run right through that intersection and have ignored what Jesus said to the disciples. And they've begun to set dates. Let me give you a, a couple of illustrations of this. This has been happening from virtually the moment Jesus ascended. <laughs> Three theologians, Hippolytus, Sextus, and Arrhenius, in the year 500, set the date for the year 500 AD that Jesus would be coming back. Fast forward to 17 or 793, and a little Spanish monk named Beatus set the date for Jesus' second coming for 6th of April, 793. Pope Sylvester II said that Jesus would come back and set up his kingdom on January 1st, 1000 AD. Whoosh, came and went, nothing happened. Michael Stifel, he was a mathematician. He said that Judgment Day would begin on October 19th, 1533 at 8 a.m. in the morning. Very, very specific. Joseph Morris in 1861 told his followers not to plant any crops because Christ will come tomorrow. I hope they didn't listen to him because they had starved to death. Charles Taze Russell, who was the first president of the, of the Jehovah's Witnesses, said that Jesus would come back and set up his kingdom in 1874. Nope. Herbert W. Armstrong, founder of the Church of God, Set the first date, 1935. Well, that didn't happen, so he fast-forwarded it to 1943. Then 1972, then 1975. Nothing happened on either of those four dates, and then he died. Edgar C. Wisenant. This is more, uh, more in my time of life. This was two years after I graduated from high school. He published a book entitled 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. And when that didn't happen, he republished the book and retitled the book 89 Reasons Why Jesus or Why the Rapture Will Be in 1989. And the books flew off the shelves. People bought them by the masses. He made a bundle. Most, uh, most recently, Mark Biltz. Mark Biltz started in 2008 teaching that Christ's return would correspond with the 28th of September, 2015 lunar eclipse. And many of you remember this. His idea was known as the blood moon prophecy. And a lot of big name prof uh, pastors got on board with this and it was even featured in the USA Today. Media ate it up. Well, here we are, 2021. So here's the application, friends. Cults are formed around this topic of the coming of Jesus. People have committed suicide like the Heaven's Gate cult and the Haleybop Comet. 39 people committed suicide thinking the coming of the Haleybop Comet was the closing of Heaven's Gate. <laughs> Not the case. And a lot of money has been made by crackpot authors and false prophets around this topic of the coming of Jesus, the end of times. The very thing he said, you won't know. It's not for you to know. So don't waste your time. I promise you there will be more coming. And I could give you about a dozen more that have predicted for 2020, 2025, 2030. They just continue. It will never stop. So God the Father alone holds the clock. And it's a terrible distraction and even destructive to try to determine this date. 
Don't do it. Don't get caught up in it. Don't waste your time. But a second takeaway is this. Swaying the date of the end is our job. Let me say it again. Swaying or influencing the date of the end, the date of Jesus coming, is our job. Let me explain. Setting the date, not our job. Swaying the date, that is our job. The disciples came to Jesus. They asked him, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, what were they referring to? Stick with me as I talk a little bit about biblical prophecy and biblical timelines. Here's what they were referring to. Israel as a nation was resurrected in fulfillment of Ezekiel chapter 37, a powerful prophecy about the nation of Israel being resurrected from absolute death. They were resurrected on May 14th, 1948. Mark that date down. It is one of the most significant prophetic dates in all of history. The nation of Israel was resurrected from nothing to becoming a sovereign nation again, May 14th, 1948. But the Bible in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 prophesies not just a resurrected nation, but a restored nation back to its original grandeur and power that it had experienced under the reign of David and Solomon. Here are some of the details of that kingdom. It would experience peace, prosperity, purity from idolatry, and the presence of a king who would be the offspring of David. Now, who is that? Jesus, of course. <laughs> but it would also be a kingdom that lasted for 1,000 years. This was prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 and Revelation 19 and 20. Now, to give you some perspective, Rome lasted 503 years. If you want to call the United States an empire, it has lasted for 244 to be 245 years on July 4th. So this kingdom that the disciples were referring to, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, was a prophetic event to take place in the future when Jesus would return, set up this incredible, powerful, peaceful, prosperous, pure kingdom, reigning and ruling from Jerusalem in fulfillment of Ezekiel 40 through 48, Revelation 19 and 20. Now, when was this going to happen? That was their big question. And of course, Jesus said, it's not for you to know, and it's not for us to know, but he gave hints. He gave signs. And so I want to look at those. Matthew 24, go with me to Matthew 24, verse Three to begin with, because this was a conversation Jesus had already initiated with the disciples. So Matthew 24, verse 3. They asked him, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So Jesus coming and the end of the age. Now, what were they referring to? The end of the age. I'm going to talk about this in several messages coming in far more detail, but here's the reality. Time is broken up into seasons, and we are living in a season or an age that Jesus called in Luke chapter 4, the favorable year of the Lord. That is the age that we are living in right now, the favorable year of the Lord. It was initiated when Jesus stood up in the synagogue at age 30, and it will come to a close at the second coming of Jesus. And during this favorable year of the Lord, not a literal year, but a period of time, an age, it is an open invitation from Jesus for all on this planet to come and receive the grace, the forgiveness, the eternal life, the release from bondage, the forgiveness of sin, the cleansing that Jesus offers that he purchased on the cross by his blood, by his death, by his suffering, and by his burial, and by his resurrection. 
There is an open invitation. It has a starting period. It has an ending period. And the disciples asking, when does the ending period come? Great question. Now, Jesus gave us the finish line in Matthew 24, verse 14. Go with me to that verse. He said this, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then, then the end shall come. Now, let's put pick this apart. What is the gospel of the kingdom? That is the message of the favorable year of the Lord, that Jesus is offering forgiveness. That's the good news, that we can be free, <laughs> that the bondages of sin and of depression and despair and fear and anxiety, especially fear and anxiety about our own mortality and our own death, that we can be free of that. We can be cleansed and forgiven completely of any and all sin and walk freely in relationship with the living God who loves us and gave his life for us. That is the gospel of the kingdom. That is the gospel of the favor of God during this season, during this age of time. And so that message had to be preached, had to be shared with the whole world. With the whole world. He says, when that message is preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations. Now, what does that mean? All the nations doesn't just mean the 197 countries that make up our world. There are 197 nations that make up the planet. But within those nations are what this verse talks about, ta ethne. It doesn't mean a literal nation. It means a people group that has its own distinct language. Jesus is saying this incredible message of grace, incredible message of forgiveness, incredible message of freedom will not be preached in a foreign language. It will be preached to every person in their heart language. God is going to speak heart to heart to the people of the world. Every people group will receive this message in their original language. Awesome. Someone came to me the other day and asked the age-old, very good question. What about those people who've never heard? What about those people in the jungle? What about those people who don't have a church, a Bible, etc.? This is your verse, brothers and sisters, Matthew 24, 14. Jesus is prophesying that every people group will receive this message of the favor of God in their own language. And the end will not come until they do. That is awesome. That is the good heart and the great, kind, majestic heart of our God. Wow. So, now, he said in this verse also, he said, this gospel will be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations. Now, who will be the witnesses? <laughs> Go to Acts chapter 1 verse 8. That's you and me. Jesus says in verse 8, verse 7, he says, not for you to know this. Here's what you're to know. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. So this message of the gospel going out into all the earth, that's our job. We're the ones sharing this favorable year of the Lord, this message of the goodness of God, of the sacrifice of the Son of God, Jesus. That's our job. So this takeaway is that we're not setting dates, but we're swaying the dates based on our obedience to this great commission that Jesus gave to his disciples then and us now, because we are his disciples now. So that's our job. We're the witnesses. We're taking this this message of the favorable year of the Lord to the ends of the earth, to every people group, every language group. Now, how are we doing? How are we doing? Get ready. Here's fun. Here, this is going to be fun. Where are we at in the process? And, and we could also ask, how close is the end of the age? So I'm going to share this with you. This is information from the Joshua Project, Wycliffe Bible Translators, and Global Frontier Missions. That's their complete mission and life's work to compile these amazing statistics. Hang with me. Here we go. So how many ethnic groups are there? How many people groups speaking a common language are there? There are just around 13,000 of them 
amongst the 197 countries of the world, 13,000. Now, at the start of the 1800s, only 2,000 of the 13,000 had heard this incredible message of the favorable year of the Lord. 11,000 ethnic groups, language groups, had not heard. They didn't even know who Jesus was, had never heard the message. Fast forward 100 years to the start of the 1900s, that number was down to 9,000 that hadn't heard. From 11 down to 9, so 4,100 roughly of these language groups had heard the message of the gospel. Fast forward to today. It is estimated that the number of ethnic, ethno, it's called ethno-linguistic people groups that have heard the gospel is 9,360, which means there are still 3,640, 3,640 groups that have not heard the gospel yet. They don't know about Jesus. They don't know about his favor towards, towards them. But here's the good news. We are in an upright spike when it comes to people hearing the gospel. We are at a tipping point. Why? Here's why, based on a report from the Joshua Project. Over 3 billion people are now on the internet with an additional million every single day getting connected to the internet. The second most popular search topic on the internet is spiritual and religious related information, which means this. People are spiritually hungry. They're looking for answers. They're asking hard questions. They see the world in the condition that it's in. They're wondering, where is all of this going? They feel despair. They feel hopeless. They're feeling the fear of death, their own mortality, and they're asking hard questions, and they're inquiring of the internet. What are the answers? So here are the results. Here are the results. On an average day, 160,000 people are hearing the message of Jesus Christ, the favorable year of the Lord, the favor of God for the first time. 160,000. Of that 160,000, 1,600 people per hour. 1,600 people per hour are choosing to receive the gift of salvation, to accept God's favor, to accept God's forgiveness through Jesus. 1,600 per hour. An average of 3,500 new churches are springing up every week. 3,500 new churches every week. Wow. Wow. Now, let me give you some specifics. I want to start in the Middle East. Brothers and sisters, Muslim peoples are coming to faith in Jesus at an unprecedented pace, despite intense persecution. Let me give you some thoughts and numbers on this. The key to this is radio, television, and internet-based ministries. One mission agency says this, probably in the last 15 years, more Muslims have come to faith in Christ than in the past 1,500 years. Unbelievable. In Turkey, one-third of the converts to Christianity had this testimony, and that was this, that they met Jesus in a dream or a vision. In a dream or a vision. Now, here's what most people don't understand. The Quran, the holy book of the Muslims, of, of Islam, reveres Jesus. He's called Isa, but he is revered in the Quran. And as, as Muslims study and read the Quran, Jesus is elevated more so than even Muhammad, by far anyway. And their hearts are endeared to Jesus. And, and the scripture says this, it says, if you seek me, you will find me if you search with all your heart and I will be found by you, says the Lord. That is a promise from Scripture. When, when God gives light, and the prophet Isa in the Quran is a little ray of light, and when they begin to pursue that little ray of light, their heart begins to pursue the light. God the Father, God the, 
in the scripture says, if you seek me, you will find me if you search with all your hearts. And there are Muslims that are seeking and they're finding Jesus in dreams and visions. This isn't just happening by the handful. It's happening by the tens of thousands in the Muslim world. Muslims are giving their hearts to Jesus in mass. Massive amounts. Now, I have a question for you. In what country of the world are more people coming to Jesus at, at a breakneck pace than any other country? What country would you guess are people giving their hearts to Jesus faster than any other country? Hope that question makes sense. Here's the answer. Iran. In Iran. In Iran, it's estimated that more Iranians have become followers of Jesus in the last 35 years than in the past 1,400 years combined. It is estimated in Iran that thousands every week are putting their faith in Jesus, and friends, they're being persecuted horribly for it. There is a price to pay when they give their hearts to Jesus. Many of them are having to flee the country because their own necks are on the line. Their lives are on the line. But they consider it worth it to have Jesus despite the persecution and the death threats. That is a testimony to you and me. In Israel, a nation with 70% of the population professing to be atheistic, there are now over 15,000 professing followers of Yeshua. Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, and that number is growing. In the United States, there are at least 350,000 Jews who profess to follow Yeshua, Jesus their Messiah. Now, this is an incredible thing. Israel is amazing. There is a ministry in Israel called One for Israel, O-N-E for Israel Ministry. They have capitalized on the fact that Israel is number one in the world spending time on Facebook and YouTube. Number one, 70% of all their phone time is not calling friends and neighbors and parents. It is, it, is, it is scanning through the internet. It is surfing the net. Much of it on Facebook and YouTube. They're number one in the world in time online period, tied with Canada. So this ministry, One for Israel, have, has capitalized on this. They have created absolutely powerful videos of men and women who have come to faith in Jesus from, the, from Israel, from the Arab world, uh, Jews living in the United States, Jews that are is Israelis that are incredibly educated, Nobel Prize winners, people from all spectrums of life, men, women, teenagers, elderly, I've watched hours of these videos and have just wept at the powerful transformation that they've experienced when they encountered Jesus. And there have been 27 million views of these videos. 27 million. God is on the move, brothers and sisters. This message of the gospel, this message of the favor of God is going to the ends of the earth is going to these language groups. Now, let me continue. It gets even more exciting. In Nepal, I was in Nepal in 1994. I was arrested in Nepal. I was questioned by, by the chief of police at, in, a, in a village way up in the Himalayas, and then by God's grace, I was released. We were sharing the gospel with the Nepali people. But at that time, there were only 75 known believers in Nepal. 75. Today, there are an estimated 850,000 believers in Nepal. Unbelievable. When I was there, there were no churches that we know of in Nepal. Today, there are nearly 10,000 churches amongst former Buddhists and Hindus of Nepal. God is working. The message is going out. Brazil. In 1960, there were 2 million believers in a country that I believe is around 200 million. Today, there are over 51 million people who profess faith in the Lord Jesus. And now they've been coming, they've become a sending nation where they're sending people to other nations, over 2,000 missionaries going out from Brazil to tell others in other countries about Jesus. Absolutely mind-boggling. China. In 1950, when China closed their doors to missionaries, 
there were about 1 million Chinese believers. You want to venture guess how many believers are in China today? An estimate? 75 million. 75 million. It is estimated that 10,000 Chinese people per day are giving their hearts to Jesus. It's, the, it's one of the fastest growing churches in the world. Globally, there are over 40,000 people a day pledging allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ and coming into this family of God, transferring from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, receiving the favor of God. The gospel of the kingdom is being preached to the whole world. And we get the privilege of being part of that. We don't set the dates, but we sway the dates, brothers and sisters. God is at work. Now, I want to end with one particular verse that will tie this all together. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, Peter is exhorting the believers. He's exhorting the believers. He's speaking intensely to the believers. You can, you can feel the passion in Peter as he shares these words with the believers. And I pray that you'll feel the passion coming through me as I read these verses from the Apostle Peter, who had denied the Lord Jesus, but had been forgiven, had been reinstated to his position as leader, had been filled, baptized with the power of the Holy Spirit, and given a leader's leadership position in the church, as we will see as we continue through the book of Acts. This is Peter, who is now an older man, an elderly man, speaking to believers like you and me. And here's what he has to say. He says this, Don't you see how vital it is to live a holy life? We must be consumed with godliness while we anticipate and help to speed up the coming of the day of God. That is exactly what they were asking him about. When will the end of the age come? It's another term for the day of God. I'm going to read this verse again because these are our marching orders. This ties this all together. He says, don't you see how vital it is to live a holy life? We must be consumed with godliness while we anticipate and help to speed up the coming of the day of the Lord or the day of God. Dear friends, we are not meant to set dates, but we are meant to sway the date. And how do we do that? There are two things in this verse that indicate how we are to do that. Number one, we are to live holy lives. When we live holy lives, our lives are testimonies of the grace of God. They are light shining in the darkness. They're a city set on a hill. They are salt that preserves and creates thirst. When we are not living holy lives, when we are allowing sin to reside in our hearts, when we are backslidden, when we are lukewarm, when the things of God are just a peripheral element of our lives and not the very center and focus, we hinder this work of God and we push out further the coming of the end of the age. Friends, we sway this date, our behavior, our obedience. It influences the coming of Jesus. And that's what he says, while we anticipate and help to speed up the coming of the day of the Lord. You and I have the ability to influence the time that Jesus comes back. Our lives matter. Your life matters. You say, well, I'm just one of seven, almost eight billion people. Your life matters. What you do matters. When you choose holiness and righteousness and obedience to Jesus over temptation and sin and lust and all the rest, it matters. It matters in the eternal scope of things. It matters in the timetable of this planet. It matters in bringing this age to an end and all the groaning and the curse of sin. It matters. Your life matters. And Peter says this, don't you see how vital it is to live a holy life? Don't you? 
Brothers and sisters, if you're living in sin, if there is temptation, if there's, there's a pattern of sin that has gripped you, deal with it. Repent of it. Get help. Bring that into the light of fellowship with other believers. Get that sin out of your life and begin to live a holy life. He says we must be consumed with godliness. Being like Jesus, allowing the presence of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the personality of Jesus, the message of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, the purity of Jesus to flow through our lives to the world that doesn't know him yet. And as we do, not only do we anticipate and look forward to the coming of Jesus, we help to speed it up. Wow, our king has delegated this awesome responsibility to you and me. So my prayer for you, live for Jesus. Make sure he is the king on your heart. Speak for Jesus. Don't be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Not some neutral pathetic, apathetic God, but Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. People need to hear the name of Jesus from your lips. It might cause ripples. It better cause ripples. It needs to cause ripples. People need to be shaken. They need to be awakened to the fact that the favorable year of the Lord has an end to it. It doesn't go on indefinitely. It isn't influenced by their sincerity. They must repent of their sin and put their faith and trust in Jesus and receive the gift of eternal life. <laughs> and we get to influence that. Praise the Lord. What a gift. What a privilege. So I want to pray for you. Father, may this truth shake us to our core. May it drive us to our knees in gratitude, but also help us to get up off our knees in obedience to you and be your mouthpiece, be the light shining in darkness. Oh God, we commit ourselves to holy lives, to being consumed with godliness, to speeding up the coming of the day of God. Lord, we surrender to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, may you be challenged to walk forward now with this truth. Thank you for being here. Thank you for letting me share with you. We'll see you next time in the wrestling room. God bless your week. Bye-bye.